I don't normally swear when I'm talking about theology, but there's one question where I probably will, and I don't know if you guys, <laughs> if that's okay or not. Welcome to A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar. The podcast where we mix a sometimes weird but always delicious cocktail of theology, philosophy, and spirituality. Welcome, friends, to A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar. Today, we have this really wonderful conversation with a Catholic theologian. I know that many of us probably, when I say we're talking with a Catholic theologian, our interest peaks. And some of us probably are like, what are you talking about? I promise it's compelling, it's interesting, it's fun, and it's challenging. It was challenging to me. So I'm excited about that conversation. Kyle, hello. 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 Hi, Elliot. <laughs> oh, hi, Elliot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. I no, no, no. I you're there you're like the Holy Spirit. I mean, just hovering over the the chaos, brooding. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Elliot. Jeez. Cheers. So, Randy, what are we what are we drinking today? Uh, something fun. Well, I hope it's fun. I haven't tried it, but our friends at Story Hill BKC have supplied us with a noteworthy bourbon. And I don't. Now are you say, saying that it's a uh, a noteworthy bourbon, or I hope it's both noteworthy, <laughs> but I know that it's called noteworthy bourbon. It's from the distillery is called Owensboro Distilling Company in Owensboro, Kentucky, which apparently mm. you're you're familiar with. Owens yeah, Owensboro. yeah, used to go there and eat the barbecue when I was a kid. Praise the Lord, bourbon and barbecue. <laughs> I like it already. Um, this is this is a bourbon, but it's a high rye bourbon. It's 70% corn, 21% rye, mm -hmm. and only 9% mal malted barley. It's it's a bourbon that's finished on sherry barrel staves. So the staves basically just means they're a little bit too cheap to finish it in the whole <laughs> cask. So they take Barrels out, are expensive. Man. I know, I know, I respect. <laughs> and I like thriftiness. I'm a Milwaukeean, yeah, yeah. but they take they take the the wood from the, the sherry barrels and just put the wood into into the bourbon and finish it like that. So, yeah. um, Does it say how long it was finished on those? It does not say how long. I'm, I gotta say, I'm not getting any sherry on the nose, but... It's nice nose, though. I'm, I'm getting some of those plummy things, those dark yeah, fruits that you get with... Yeah, raisin and... Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that you get yeah. with a sherry. I'm gonna disagree. I think you get, there is some sherry in the nose. <laughs> you tasted it, Kyle. What do you think? It's not what I expected. Take, do you tell. Do, do with that what you will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't had much cognac, this. but this tastes like cognac that I. Oh, that's interesting. This yeah, is fun. I can keep. I can see like mm -hmm. a, a brandy esque thing. This is only on. ninety proof. It's forty five percent alcohol, so it's it's smooth. Oh man, raisins on the finish on my tongue. Holy moly! Yeah, it's pleasant. It's so different. I mean, there's not a whole lot of heat to it in my mm -hmm. in my experience. Major raisin. No. I've never had a bourbon like this. That, that <laughs> I, I taste dates. Oh, and I like raisins. it significantly that's, that's not, better than I than I thought I would from the nose. This is very good. It's well rounded. I know that's one of those vague things, but like there aren't any flavors that seem to be overpowering. What I enjoy about it is you don't have to try to find the sweetness. Like it's it's right there. But then it's got some heat to balance it out and the like the cinnamon in the back of the throat. But see, it's not a new makey sweetness. That's no, very different. No, no, no. New makey sweetness is a is like a con for me. This sweetness here is the dark con. fruit <laughs> con. Sorry, Beth. No, this tastes like an earned sweetness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed it was a high rye, to be honest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, man. I like it. It's so unique. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have that sweet corn thing. Uh, that And maybe that's the high rye, where you finish it with sherry. You get that sh those sherry notes, but then the rye actually keeps it from going over the top too sweet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fully endorsed this. This is a new experience. I personally would want to drink this neat every time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't Which I mean, that else. goes for almost everything great, but we it, drink here. It would but. be a waste. <laughs> yeah, and my our friends at Story Hill BKC in Milwaukee tell me that they have two cases of this stuff on hand right now. In other words, it's going to go, and it's going to go fast. So go into Story Hill BKC, get this noteworthy yeah. bourbon. Tell them it is a pastor and a philosopher walked into a bar, yeah. told you to go get it. Aptly named. It reminds me a little bit of the Mash Bill Number no. Two from Buffalo Trace. So if you're a fan of any of those supposedly high rye bourbons mm -hmm. i think you'd probably like this one i think it compares favorably to what um what's that place is it mgp or something the mm. indian the big indiana producer that i'm not sure. contracts out to a bunch of other places they're kind of known for their high rye bourbon i think this is better this is delicious i really like it 
Again, grab it at Storkill BKC in Milwaukee. And if you're not in Milwaukee, support local. If you are in Milwaukee, grab this. And then I try their burger. And I dare you to find a better burger than you find at Story Hill BKC. Mm -hmm. Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited about our guest today, a good friend of mine. Uh, we were doing our PhDs simultaneously at Marquette University. And he is now an assistant professor of theology in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, my good friend, Sean Blanchard. So thanks for being with us, Sean. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, are you drinking anything you want to tell us about? Yes, I'm out of my, because I'm talking to you, out of my Marquette uh, rocks glass. <laughs> Very nice. I have a little bit left of a bottle of Pinhook rye bourbon, mm -hmm. which is very, very nice, um, which I got at a local local body shop. I can't describe it to the degree that you would be able to. <laughs> my guess is very good. that's the nicest, the, the best liquor that has been in a Marquette rocks glass. I'll bet most, <laughs> like 75% of drinks that are in a Marquette rocks glass are like Malibu and Coke. Probably. probably yeah. Right. I didn't know That's Marquette made right. rocks glasses. Yeah, I, I mostly them. drank Jack Daniels when I was a doctoral candidate, so I'm mm -hmm. sure the, the undergrads were not, you know, it would have been a couple steps down from that. <laughs> there are steps down from that. Wow, you forget, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, Burnett's, Aristocrat. Oh, I've never even heard of that. <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on. <laughs> so, yeah, let's just start. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you became a Catholic theologian? How did that happen? Well, I think growing up, I, I originally, I remember we had to do a project my freshman year of high school about what we wanted our career to be. And I remember I said I wanted to be a youth minister. And I think it's because I thought that meant you just like talked about theology in small groups of people all the time. <laughs> and then when I kind of grew up and realized what they actually do, I sort of moved away from that. But um, after I converted to Catholicism, I thought about the priesthood. I loved my religious studies classes. I wasn't a great student in uh, like the general college stuff, but I always did really well in religious studies and history classes, which was my double major. I took a great church history class, and then I took a, a, a history seminar on Luther and the German Reformation. I remember writing, doing research, kind of for the first time I did like research, other mm. than just the stuff that they assigned us to read. And I looked at the debate between Luther and Zwingli on the Eucharist, called the, the Marburg College. Is that the one where, where Luther carves into the table? Or is that a well, Yes, yes, yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah, he... he uh, he literally, yeah, he literally, Luther, in very Luther fashion, yeah, sort of strode into the room dramatically and and wrote, uh, this is my body on the table in chalk mm. uh, in, in Latin. And, and Zwingli was a bit of a character, too, so I think it, it was sort of doomed from the beginning. But I found it really interesting trying to kind of enter into their way of thinking, and and I think that led me into what, at the doctoral level, they would call historical theology, so mm. trying to understand what Christians at certain times in history have thought and why, and then I very much try to inform the present with those lessons from the past. So I really enjoyed that. Also, my senior year of undergrad, I did a, um, a film project on neo-atheism and Christianity. So like, you know, these guys that were really popular maybe 10, 15 years ago, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens. And then I, I went on to graduate school at, at Oxford and then Marquette. So Sean, you... I understand, haven't always been Catholic. And you walked us through kind of, you know, I wanted to be a youth minister, then considered the priesthood. Tell us about your transition from, I'm assuming, Protestantism into Catholicism and why that happened. I was actually an Armenian Orthodox. Um, no, I'm just kidding. No, I was, uh, I, I was a, we were Reformed Baptist. I was raised Reformed Baptist. So we were... That explains everything. <laughs> we were Calvinistic, sort of. We okay. were Calvinistic when we wanted to be. Yeah, that's all like uh, good Calvinist. <laughs> so it was it was we were we were quintessentially American because mm -hmm. we could you know we could we could take what we liked from from all these different you know currents, and we were very much encouraged to study the Bible. We were encouraged to um, to read pastors, scriptural commentators, apologists, but we didn't really study church history. So my path into Catholicism was fairly typical. I realized it was actually fairly typical. I thought it was I thought it was so unique and, and so interesting when I was in my late teens, but I really wasn't. It was very typical. 
I think it was two basic things. I, um, I started thinking about ecclesiology, about the ideas of, you know, what is the church? How is the church organized? Uh, how do we kind of make sense of it at, at a more sort of uh, bird's eye view? We moved to Minnesota and we started going to John Piper's church and I really, really didn't like it. Um, it was way too liberal for me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, it wasn't that. It wasn't that. It was that it was, it was kind of Christian cliche culture in a certain way. It was like everybody read the I Kiss Dating Goodbye and all that kind of stuff. And I hadn't really been exposed to any of that. We were so kind of sectarian in our Christianity that we didn't, we looked sort of askance at like people who listen to Third Day <laughs> and people who read Christianity. Like we didn't do any of that. We just listened to like, I mean, my parents secretly listened to Bob Dylan, but, Get on you it. know, you just, music was just like hymns and classical music. And so like, we weren't plugged into mainstream American Christian culture. So I didn't like it. It was a culture shock. I went to public school, which was different from most of the kids. So I was this weird combination of like, I was kind of secular, but then I was, my Christianity was actually like deeply sort of sectarian <laughs> <laughs> in many ways. Um so I didn't, I totally rejected Piper's church. I hated it, you know, and I'm sure it was rebelling as a 13, 14 year old. And I started thinking like, well, why, how do we choose a church? On what basis are we even, because my parents had always said growing up, like we, the, you know, God has placed the elders over us um, until they, did, they didn't agree <laughs> with them, right? Like I remember <laughs> they would come out against certain movies or things like that. And my parents would go, oh, well, they haven't even seen that movie. You know, we, we can watch that movie. <laughs> So my parents were always in a sort of uh, liminal place, I suppose you could say, vis-a-vis uh, -vis kind of church authority. Anyway, long story short is through a, a path that I now have learned is quite typical. I, I started believing that the church is visible, the church is one, we know where it is. It's, it's, it's people gathered around their bishop celebrating the Eucharist. And if you live in the United States, the, the most logical place you would go for that kind of patristic vision is the Catholic Church. Uh, I suppose you you know there are there is the phenomena of of, of evangelicals convert, converting to Eastern Orthodoxy and things like that. But I never I I don't even know if I knew what that was, frankly, when I was seventeen, eighteen. So I I converted to Catholicism for these sort of ecclesiological and and kind of sacramental reasons. Uh, baptism and communion are are symbolic, but they also sort of actually actually convey grace. They're 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 both uh, both symbols and and kind of realities. Uh, of grace. So it, it was, it was that sort of stuff. Wow. As a high schooler. <laughs> Sheesh. What a nerd. <laughs> well, on one hand, yeah, but you know, the interesting thing, and I've listened to, I listened to that one episode of you guys, and I think you guys can sort of relate to this that, or at least, at least Kyle can, you're told you have to make sense of all of this. You know, you have to know the reason why you do all these things or else you'll go to college and you'll, you know, you, the, the evil atheist professor will mm -hmm. cackle and, and tell you, you know, in some ways they sort of, they, they created this <laughs> monster, <laughs> I suppose, <laughs> because they said, you know, study all these apologetics, yeah. do all this stuff. So I was, I was strange, but I was also, if you tell a certain type of kid what they tell people, you're going to get me eventually. yeah <laughs> i mean occasionally. there's a lot of truth to that i remember a few years ago it was the 500th anniversary of the protestant reformation and you posted a thing on facebook i didn't go back and read it again but i remember being kind of moved by it frankly and you approached it in a way that i hadn't heard anybody approach it before certainly that i hadn't heard any protestants approach it before and your reflection on it was kind of mournful having been a protestant and converted to catholicism how, how do you view that mm. moment in church history and how do you view where we are now in relation to it? And if you're willing to speculate, where do you see it going in the future? It's very, very complex and it's very personal to me. I think as, as you, as you read in that Facebook post, I, I know what it's like to root for the other team. I remember the old hymns. I remember the kind of apologetics about it, the rhetoric about it. It plays strongly into a sense of kind of national identity and a sense of cultural independence. The way that I view it is essentially a, a Catholic reform that failed. A, a, a Catholic reform that was rejected unjustly and then became non-Catholic as a result of it being rejected. So I think that Luther was not inevitable. I think Luther was one of 
five, six, seven, eight different reform currents. And we're, we remember it as something new and different because of the peculiar confluence of sinful people and misunderstandings and national and cultural tensions that were going on in that particular time and place. So I don't view Luther as some sort of demonic villain, which you'll still get that taken in, in kind of in certain Catholic polemic. You'll still get this kind of ridiculously uh, over-the-top negative judgment of Luther. I don't view him that way. I don't view him as some sort of prophetic figure either. I view him as a, as a, a man who had, who had very good intentions initially, and then because of uh, sin on both sides, you know, the, the train went off the tracks to, to everyone's detriment to the detriment of the people who remained Catholic, so to speak, Roman Catholic, and to the new groups. Um, so that's why I have a sort of mournful, I don't view it as a kind of winning, you know, I don't think anybody won in that. And I think every, everybody lost. I think the Catholic Church lost certain ideals that it had to later recover because it had jettisoned them. And I think that I, I'm of I'm I agree with those Protestants who say Protestantism can't be an endpoint. It has to be a uh, a means back into visible communion of some kind. It, even those who will say it was justified. I, mean, I have a lot of Protestant friends who say the Protestant Reformation was justified. I stand by it. I defend it. Nevertheless, it can only be a temporary solution or 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 a temporary home for f- full full visible unity. So, Sean couple questions for you there, then I appreciate, the thing I appreciate about my Catholic brothers and sisters more than anything is your high value of unity, way more than most any Protestants I know. And that challenges me. But a couple of comments, given the state of the Catholic Church in the, you know, 15th, 16th century, wouldn't you agree that the Reformation, some sort of Reformation, some sort of splitting, some sort of violent separation was almost inevitable given the corruption of the church in that point and the resistance to change that was in the Catholic church. Would you agree with that or not? Um, historically speaking, probably. Uh, the, the same way that there was probably, historically speaking, it was inevitable that East and West mm-hmm. would split mm-hmm. at some point, right? The, 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 the contingent factors were not inevitable or, or the, the, the actors that actually made this happen, their actions were not inevitable. Nevertheless, the fact that there would be some sort of cataclysmic event, I, I would probably agree that was inevitable in the 16th mm-hmm. century. And, you know, when we talk about the great schism, you know, between East and West, or we talk about the reformation, I don't, and this is me as a good Protestant probably, but I don't see that as the, the great tragedy that, you know, good Catholics would, maybe you would. I see, I see a lot of beauty, honestly, in different streams of the church, and I don't see a whole lot of ability. Now, that's, I should walk that back a little bit. I know there's a tremendous amount of diversity within the Catholic tradition, um, and I really, really enjoy it. The more I get to know the diversity within the Catholic tradition between the Benedictines and the Franciscans and the Jesuits and the, you know, you name it, I love finding the nuance there. And it, encourages me and I love seeing it. But I love a lot of things about the Eastern Orthodox Church, particularly their theology, particularly about the atonement, particularly about their eschatology. I enjoy probably more than the Protestants and the Catholics, both of them. So I enjoy things about the Orthodox Church. I enjoy, obviously, a lot of things about the Protestant Church and the Catholic Church. And part of me wants to be really pie in the sky and say, can't we all just be one big happy family, even though we're not, you know, the one Catholic, holy Catholic church. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I hope I don't sound, um, I mean, Catholics always agree with qualification, right? So I hope I don't do that to every (laughs) single question that you ask me (laughs) or agree with some sort of distinction drawn. But, um, yes, I mean, there's always been diversity and any, and I think when Catholics, there are uninformed Catholics who will say, oh, well, ecumenism is just everybody becomes Catholic. (laughs) And, and what they mean is, you two start worshiping in a Latin Rite Catholic Church, you know, which is the kind of jurisdictional apparatus of of what we often think of as Roman Catholic, right? When we have uh, Egyptian Catholics and Ukrainian Catholics and mm-hmm. these other kind of you know jurisdictional bodies. I, I shouldn't say jurisdictional; they're they're ancient linguistic and cultural traditions that have uh, 
a measure of jurisdictional autonomy. They're called rights mm-hmm. in the Catholic Church, R-I-T-E. So, yes, I mean, had the Great Schism not happened in 1054 or whenever we actually date it to really happening, um, the, the, you know, the liturgy and the theology, I would say, of the Eastern Orthodox, what we call now Eastern Orthodox, would be different. And what I mean by that is a, a theology of atonement that is not doctrinally in contradiction to the other mm-hmm. churches, which I think is the case now, right? I don't think there's, I wouldn't say there's anything problematic about Orthodox mm-hmm. doctrine about atonement, even though theologically sure. it's different. So I try to draw this distinction, like the, um, the Armenian Orthodox, to go back to my, my, my original <laughs> church, their theology of the Eucharist is different from what I was taught in, as, as a Catholic, because I'm taught on the basis of medieval universities and Aristotelianism and, you know, Kyle Whitaker type <laughs> philosophy, you know, straight Aristotelian yeah. Thomism, you know, um, the, the, the theological difference is healthy and good and beautiful. The liturgical difference is healthy and good and beautiful. But I don't think that doctrinal difference uh, understood very strictly um, is, is good. Describe the difference between theological difference and doctrinal difference. So I, the way I'm understanding this is that um, there can be many, many theologies of atonement ways of making sense of it, uh, images that you use, philosophical traditions you come from, cultural imagery, lens, whatever. But the doctrine would be a more fundamental kind of distillation. What happens? Of the, 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 say the meaning of the theology, mm-hmm, perhaps, mm-hmm. something like that. So, you know, in, like in, in grad school, they'll say, oh, have you read von Balthasar's theology of the Trinity and Lonergan's theology of the Trinity? No one thinks that these things contradict one another. On doctrine, they may they may have genuine difference. Um, the question, of course, becomes how do you manage this difference in a way that doesn't lead to a kind of um, doctrinal incompatibility. Mm-hmm. And so, you're saying for you, theologically, we can be diverse. Doctrinally, we have to remain pure. Yes. If okay. I had to say it, if if you force me to say something simple, I would I would say that yes. Okay. Yes. That's interesting. I I enjoy that perspective, and it challenges me because I want to make bigger space for us to be able to have even doctrinal differences. And there are there are things that I would say I can't doctrinally differ with you on this and still consider ourselves part of the same faith. There are there are some of those for me, but there's not many because I want to be able to just have a generous orthodoxy enough to the fact that we can have differences, substantial differences on the Eucharist or substantial differences on, you know, Mary, for instance, or whatever it might be, and still consider one another brothers. And, and I, I would like to think that you consider me a brother in the faith, but... Oh, certainly, certainly. As far as even being able to worship together and being in the same church, that's a big difference where I'm playing pretty loosey-goosey here, and you as a good Catholic would say, no, that's a little bit too much. Tell me why. Well, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I would say that from the Catholic perspective, we are brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ with people who are baptized into the Trinity. Okay. So if you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you're a Christian. There's a sense, this might sound horribly imperialistic, there's a sense that you're a, uh, a, a small C Catholic, sure. that we would consider you a family member who's not coming to the Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> I'm honored. But you're in yeah, the thanks. same family. Because there's only one family. There's only one baptism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there is no Presbyterian baptism, Catholic baptism. You know, there's one baptism. So um, the, the way that Catholics would typically approach this is there is a sacramental unity between Protestants and Catholics and Orthodox on baptism, which means that we are Christians. The, the problem becomes... If we're celebrating the Eucharist with a specific understanding of ordination, a specific understanding of what the Eucharist is, that to us is is central to our identity as Catholics in a way that disagreement perhaps about certain other matters of church government or, say, certain types of piety, devotion, veneration of Mary, veneration of saints is not necessarily central in the same sense. Mm -hmm. So the problem for Catholics becomes when they're 
I mean, for very practical reasons, frankly, the problem becomes when there's different understandings of ordination of clergy and there's different understandings of sacraments, because those are very concrete things that people do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and there, there's no getting around the difference the way that there could be, say, much diversity in understanding of atonement or even of maybe how the communion of saints works. Mm-hmm. And that I think part of that is not just theological, it's partly just... How do you run a church of 1.2 billion people on seven continents? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You kind of you have to know who your clergy mm-hmm. are and who they aren't. Yep, and they have to be accountable to specific people and not to other people. So let's just just for fun, let's just experiment here and let me go on a little down a r- little rabbit hole. Protestant Catholic, you had mentioned that if if you're baptized in the Trinity, we would see you as small C Catholic brother sister in Christ. Now. I'll bet a bunch of our good Protestant friends heard that and got a little bit sideways and were like, whoa, why is baptism the badge that actually the key that unlocks that thing? Because we're told as good Protestants, and my Protestant friends are going to say this, Sean, you know it, the scriptures say it. Paul says, if faith, justified by faith through grace, Mm -hmm. that's the badge. And N.T. Wright would even say, um, justification, like that faith is that justification. It's like that badge that gets us in, which it sounds like you were saying baptism is the thing. Why would mm-hmm. you say baptism is that thing instead of faith? Mm-hmm. Well, I think Luther would agree with this, actually, at least as I read him, and I might, might maybe I'll be corrected by a Lutheran, but baptism is inexplicable apart from faith. So you, you either have an adult hopefully seeking baptism unless Charlemagne or someone forces him to be baptized, you know, mm-hmm. which, which has happened in history. But I mean, hopefully an adult uh, person is, is seeking baptism because they have come to faith in the triune God. Now, most Catholics and maybe most Protestants actually, uh, or I, actually, I'm not sure if most, but a great many Protestants are baptized as babies. The idea there is that there is a, a, a faith of the community, a faith of the parents, a faith of the sponsors, that is active. So there is no baptism apart from faith. The difference, though, I mean, you point to a very real difference. So for Luther and for the Protestant Reformation, that you know, the true church is um, where the gospel is correctly preached and the sacraments are rightly celebrated. In, in, in the Catholic Church, you can just be a bad parish or a pastor who's not <laughs> preaching the gospel correctly, but you're still Catholic. Mm-hmm you're still sacramentally Catholic. You're just not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So the, the um, identity is objective. And again, there's probably, there's not probably, mm-hmm. there's certainly mm-hmm. cultural and political factors historically for this. But the identity is objective. Nevertheless, we would recognize, of course, that if, let's say, a Protestant was, was, was not baptized, that doesn't mean God is not working in the person's life and supplying them grace and, and that they're, they're going to go to heaven when they die. So we are bound by a system because we live in community and we have sociological structures. God, of course, is not, is not bound by this. So we, you know, we have these things, so the baptism of desire, the baptism of blood, all these ways of sort of getting around and saying, how could the person be saved who hasn't done X, Y, Z objective thing? You know, um, it's supplied by their faith, by God, et cetera. Fun. Yeah, that's good. That is, uh, as I was trying to read your, some, of your, some of your articles, which I got to say was challenging because it feels like you, were, you, you speak in code when you, when you write theologically. <laughs> and that's not just because it's theological, it's because it's Catholic. And I was like, holy moly, I barely yeah. understand this stuff, yeah. like another language. Oh, it was very in-house. A lot of that was in-house baseball, so I'm sorry about it's that. It's all right. It was, yeah, <laughs> it literally was like, whatever. Um, but The rules of a game you don't play. Yeah. But I really did kind of pick up on this for the first time, this nuance that Catholicism values objectivity much more than Protestantism, right? That Protestantism is very loosey-goosey in the lines that we draw, and we get to draw our own lines, and we get to figure out what the boundaries and the rules are. Church by church, in many, many ways, if not denomination by denomination, network by network, and then there's little branches of Lutheranism that, you know, are different. It's just so subjective, and we get to make the rules. And we Protestants would say, and by Protestants, I mean more evangelical tradition, we would say, well, the Bible makes the rules. The reality, hopefully you understand if you 
do think that, listeners, is that we all see the Bible differently, and we all say the Bible makes my rules, but we all have different rules. So that's subjective. It's it's different. Catholicism, it seems like I'm, I'm understanding that good Catholics really enjoy objectivity and saying, here's where it is, here's where we draw the lines, and that's a safe place. That's the best way to operate and function. I don't know if I would agree with that, but that's what I'm picking up. Would you agree with that? I would certainly agree with it when it comes to these issues of kind of belonging and identity. Mm-hmm. So on issues of, of so it, it actually can get quite legalistic and not very edifying, the Catholic discussions of a of, 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 of validly performed sacrament. So they'll actually have debates over if one were to use this form of words and not that form of words, would this be valid or invalid? Wow. Now, the, the important point about this, though, is that this isn't saying... God is confined by any of this. So in, in Catholic doctrine, an atheist could be saved. We don't know. We hope. We pray. We think they could be, right? Okay. But when it comes to organizing the church community, there are very, very clear uh, boundaries. This is what you say when you lay hands on someone to ordain them a priest. This is what you say when you lay hands on the bread and wine that sort of thing. And that has to do with, with trying to keep, I mean, we have theological reasons for it, but it's, I think the easiest way to understand it is how do you keep a community together that's in Japan, the Philippines, Germany, the Netherlands, New Mexico, Nova Scotia? You know, Mm -hmm. you have to have these strongly objective agreed upon forms of, of, uh, of expression. That's my understanding. Yep. That's why I think it it is because it wasn't that way in the early church to the same extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most beautiful things about the Catholic Church is that you could go on vacation to Argentina or you could go, you know, to work in Greece or wherever in the world and you could go into a Catholic church and you'd know the liturgy that they were speaking and singing just in a different language, but you'd know exactly what they're saying. That's fun. That's rich and beautiful. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Right. It, it is a beautiful thing. I will say this on objectivity, though. I Certain forms of Protestantism are more objective in their understanding of, you know, I drew that distinction between theology and doctrine. I don't, some of my Protestant friends don't have that yes, distinction. Yes, yes. So I've had, I've had, and I, I think it's probably not you guys at all, but some of my friends say, what does the Catholic Church teach about X? And they're, and, and they'll use a phrase about you know, substitutionary atonement or penal substitution or something like that. And I'll say, well, I, we don't, that's not the way we think of it. Mm-hmm. We don't use that language of a courtroom and Jesus is the defense attorney. And, uh, you know, that just isn't the way that Catholics have traditionally understood it. And I'll say, well, is it right or wrong? Do you agree? You know, do you accept it or not accept it? Well, I, I don't know. It's just not how we think about that mysterious thing. So there is subjectivity within Catholicism on on certain issues but when the issue touches upon the organization of the community or the administration of the sacraments it gets really 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 objective and we have an entire law code the code of canon law you know that you can go and get a doctorate in Mm -hmm. which i have not done and hopefully will never do (laughs) (laughs) so it's funny the protestant friends you're describing seem to want to collapse the theology side of the distinction into the doctrine side, and then they get really uncomfortable when you can't delineate the Catholic doctrine on that. I come at it exactly... They think I'm being evasive. Yeah. They think I'm intentionally mm. avoiding an answer, and the answer is I yeah. th- I don't know other than to say that's not the way that I... And think that there's that. no objective Catholic position on that. Right. Yeah. I would right. come at it from exactly the opposite angle as your Protestant friends. For me, I would want to collapse the doctrine yeah. side into the theology side. To me, it's just yeah. opinion all the way down. That's funny. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so sticking with that just shows the diversity of Protestantism, right? Sure, but I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't be claimed by many Protestants either. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, but sticking with this general theme, what you're calling objectivity, I might be a little more comfortable calling authority. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't. Mm. Philosophers mean something different by objectivity usually, and I'm not quite sure that's what we are using here, the mm-hmm. concept in that mm-hmm. way. Um, so would it be fair to say that what Catholics have that Protestants tend to lack is a clearer authority structure and that this, this gives a, a way to decide an argument about who's in and who's out and what the ecclesial structure should be and you know who bishops report to and whatever – 
what the liturgy, liturgy should look like. It gives a way to decide that argument that Protestants lack. Is that fair? I think so. I think so. I think the authority structures are far less effective in asserting their authority uh, than is typically perceived, and the debates morph and go on and on and on. Nevertheless, there are specific issues which can be solved one way or the other. And if you disagree, you have every right to disagree, but you kind of lost the debate. Mm -hmm. um, that can be clearer in Catholicism than in Protestantism, because in Protestantism, you know, a Baptist church can have a disagreement and it can just become two Baptist churches. Um, which, <laughs> or which, one which true Baptist church and one apostate Baptist church. I think. That's yeah, like, well, yeah. Right, of course, of course, yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yep. So, Sean, it's kind of sticking on this theme of authority being really, really important. You know, we, have, we kind of have to get onto this topic. When we think about well, for me, when I think about the Catholic Church, I had all sorts of beefs with the Catholic Church growing up because I was told to have these beefs with the Catholic Church. Most of those, I don't... I, I enjoy just really nuanced conversation with my Catholic friends now. But something that I think is relevant is thinking about the institution that is the Catholic Church. Right now, we talk... We're, Congress is in talks of breaking up big tech, right? Whether it's Facebook, Amazon, whatever... We live in this reality where the bigger the institution, the more opportunity there is for corruption, the more opportunity there is for um, just all sorts of unsavory things to happen. And when you think about institutions, perhaps the biggest, most historic institution the world, the modern world has known has been the Catholic Church and is the Catholic Church. And I'm a huge fan of Richard Rohr, Father Richard, and he says, any institution that's left uncritiqued becomes demonic, which I think is really, really provocative, but really, really true. Whether you're talking about yeah, a police force or a church or whatever you're talking about. The Catholic Church, in the, I think this comes down to, for me, in the way that I've interpreted and kind of tried to understand the way they've dealt with the sexual abuse scandals, is the institution is, institutionalism of, the, of it has actually hindered it from dealing rightly with the abuse scandals. Like, the, the institution has become so important that the main objective is to maintain the institution, which has probably assets of tens of billions of dollars, literally, and has over a billion followers worldwide and is 2,000 years old. I mean, talk about a powerful institution. That's it right there. And so it's no surprise to me that the number one objective, as it seems to me as an outsider, is maintain the institution, maintain the safety and the, the, the integrity of the institution over and above just doing what's right. Do you feel my uncomfortability with the huge institution that is the Catholic Church and the opportunity for so much corruption and just bad decisions because of the desire to maintain that institution? I don't know if I'm being clear. No, no, you, you absolutely are. I mean, I think I would, I would completely agree with uh, Father Richard Rohr uh, in his comment there. I haven't read that, but I, I'm familiar with some of his writing, and that definitely sounds like something he would say. I, I absolutely agree with that. And when I, when I teach church history, I say the scary thing about many periods of the church, but we'll say, let's rewind to the 16th century. The scary thing is almost none of these popes were bad people. Hmm. Uh, they were nice people. They were kind. They were loving. Most of them actually weren't sexually corrupt. There were many, many, many sexually corrupt popes at different times in history, but most of these popes during this, this when Luther was breaking away, were, were good people. And that, to me, makes it scarier. Mm -hmm. It would be easy if we said Pope Leo X, who, who was a Medici from Florence, Pope Leo X was this horrible, disgusting, corrupt, you know, sexual abuser or, or whatever. He wasn't. He was a good person. Uh, but he was a person who, who, in many ways, I shouldn't say too strongly about him because I'm not an expert on, on him, but in many ways, put the institution over what is right or what is true. Mm -hmm. So I think I don't want to sound too individualistic because there's a sense that institutions and communities are more important than individuals. Nevertheless, when you're dealing with something like the abuse crisis, to put the institution over an individual who has been harmed or in future individuals who could be harmed, I think that's something of a kind of original sin or a constant, a systemic sin in the Catholic Church, I mean, it's, I presume it's present in every institution. Yes. I mean, I've been around, you know, universities and 
families, extended families, and all kinds of uh, structures that have, that I, I think this the same thing probably goes. But as you say, the Catholic Church is enormous, so that the possible scale uh, for the sin or the kind of systemic nature for the sin becomes enormous. Another thing I would say is that I always go back to the Reformation with this because before the Reformation, Catholics were very comfortable with the word reform, hmm. reformatio in Latin. They used the word all the time. The stated purpose of the Council of Constance, which was called in 1414, for this ludicrous situation where you had three popes, you had th- three men claiming to be pope. And they said, what is the purpose of the council? Reform in head and members. Uh, reformatio in caput. Et, I forgot what members is in Latin. That's probably something <laughs> similar to the word members. Anyway. By the time Protestants were seen to sort of co-opt the word reform, and mm-hmm. Catholics stop using it. And I think that that is a, that's very telling. And this idea that we have now, like if you ask someone in Boston in the 1970s or 80s when a lot of this abuse was going on, or the high point, as far as we know, the high point of this abuse, why would you not go to the police or why would you not follow up on where the bishop moved this man that you know abused a child or, or a young person or a vulnerable person. The phrase that would always be used is not causing scandal. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's so many things wrong with that, right? Because the scandal is what happened. Mm-hmm. And the further scandal is not preventing it from happening again. But the idea is that the church is so big and so important, it's too big to fail, we might say, mm-hmm. colloquially. So if you undercut confidence in the institution, you're harming more people than any individual could do. That's, I think, the way most good people who went along with something demonic and wicked didn't do what they could have done, not because they're evil, not because they're sadistic, but because they had this ingrained systemic sin of putting an institution over the good of individuals. So I think this is a deeply ingrained, this is way more, to me, this is way bigger than any discussion of pedophilia or, or clericalism. Those are facets of a problem. The problem is a, a community that has this ingrained way of viewing, you know, not causing scandal, mm-hmm. the institution's more important than individuals. And, That's the root problem. And what's striking to me as you say that is that this, this desire to not cause scandal is from the top down and all the way in between, it seems yeah. like, right? Like you would ask somebody in Boston, why didn't you call the cops because your son was was abused or your nephew or brother, whatever. And they would tell you that not, we didn't want to cause a scandal. And that's exactly why we saw card- bishops, cardinals, popes even covering things up and trying to sweep things under the rugs to not cause scandal. So that's culturally... So you're saying... When we talk about reform in Catholicism, that might be one of the big things we need to reform at the current moment. Would you agree or not? Yes. I mean, I do think that there's tremendous progress from where we were. In two, I think Boston broke in 02. Okay. I do think there's been real progress since 02. I don't think there's been enough, and I think that we have a really, really long way to go. I do think there has been real advances in how we've understood the psychology of an abusive person, the warning signs for it. I think we, we're we starting to build a culture where people feel that it's okay to come forward and that that's actually the right and the good and the praiseworthy thing rather than a kind of shameful yeah. thing. Yep. So I think we're moving in the right direction. But this really scary thing to me as a someone who reads a lot of early modern history is you can see traces of this. You can see hints that this was going on. Mm. Uh, my mentor uh, at, at Marquette, Ulrich Lehner, has looked at a tremendous amount of documentation from uh, monasteries, mostly in the German-speaking world. And, um, and it, this was clearly a problem. Mm. I mean, sexual, sexual abuse is always a problem in, in every community, right? But this was clearly a problem. And the scary thing to me is how many generations, to use real throwback language to you know, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all this stuff about you know, third and fourth generation and all this stuff, how many generations was this gestating in and how long is it going to take to get this poison out? Because mm-hmm. I think that the kind of, you know, it, it came to the surface in the, actually in the 90s to some extent, I think, I'm not an expert on this, 
it really started coming out in the early mm -hmm. 2000s. And we kept thinking, oh, that's the big revelation. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one. Oh, no, that's the big revelation. And the reality is it's probably for my lifetime, it, this will be something that we're dealing with at a systemic level. We're always going to deal with it at an individual level. Mm -hmm. The hope is that we can get to the point where it's, it's an individual problem that is dealt with swiftly and, and clearly and transparently rather than being a, a, a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. Yep. So just dovetailing off of that a little bit, I mean, me as a Protestant looking in, I can say, and here's where, you know, being a Catholic would drive me nuts. It would actually drive me crazy, is I enjoy, like we, I pastor a church that is identified as evangelical for, you know, 15 years since I started it. And we now are making the decision to drop the evangelical label because we see so much gone wrong in the evangelical tradition. We think it's actually a barrier to unbelievers to say, if we're an evangelical church, I think there's a whole lot of people who have no interest in us. So let's just drop it because we can do that. I like being able mm -hmm. to do something like that. And when I look from the outside looking into at the Catholic church, I'm just like, geez, Louise, guys, can we just let priests get married? For one thing, you wouldn't have a crisis of a lack of priests anymore. And for another thing, maybe maybe that would help this crisis. And then, you know, like, okay, since we're letting priests get married, can we also let women be ordained and become priests? I mean, these should just be simple things that we could just do. And that's a major, that's just a, a rough spot for me with the Catholic Church is that you just can't do what's right, what seems right to me. Now, I'm being very extreme here, and I'm using extreme words, but I kind of think that. Well, it's okay to use extreme language. I mean, we're talking about, you know, this uh, extreme thing, right? The abuse crisis. So, I mean, it's if it's ever warranted, it would be now. Um, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing about it, you don't really control the the brand, as it were. I mean, you guys can kind of shape your brand, right? You can just say, hey, we call ourselves... First Independent Christian Church of Milwaukee, or Good job. the the name is Brew City, correct? But you have you have you identify in literature or in in, in you used to identify publicly as evangelical, yeah, yeah, right. And then you're just removing references to that, mm -hmm. right? Okay, yeah. I mean, I guess like so, Catholic to us is just what we are, right? I mean, it would be it would be like saying, you know, can you identify as not like Christian anymore, not human. I mean, it just is what I am, right? So whether I like it or not, it is what I am, mm -hmm. is how we would view it. Regarding these specific reforms, I mean, the issue of married married priests is a really interesting issue for Roman Catholicism, for Latin Rite Catholicism, which is what I am and what most people in America are. There are Catholic uh, churches, small C churches, the Ukrainians and the Egyptians, and most of the ones that are in the, the kind of eastern parts of the old Roman Empire that do have married priests, because that's their tradition, their liturgical sacramental uh, tradition. The Western church, which then sent missionaries everywhere, and in, in some case, sadly, conquistadors, the people that received Catholicism from Western Catholics are Latin, right? And therefore don't have married priests. It's something that's been discussed a ton. I think it's going to be discussed more and more. And I'm, I'm open to it for reasons that are mostly independent of the abuse crisis. I don't think that, I, I don't think that celibate people, people who abstain from sex then become abusive. I think, you know, that's putting the cart before the horse uh, with the understanding of abuse. Sure. And we do have abuse, of course, with People who are married and people who are openly mm -hmm. sexually active can also, of course, be abusive people. Where I would see merit in the way you're approaching it is that we need to find a way, whether it's through married priests or whether it's through a reform of how people are formed in the priesthood, of identifying the psychological profile of people who are prone to this sort of thing. Mm. So in that there is a, an indirect way i think that allowing married priests would increase a kind of transparency but i don't it wouldn't eliminate the problem because mm -hmm. i i know protestant uh, situation i mean from my own personal experience of hearing about this place and that place and there was cover, there were cover ups and there were 
some people went to the police and some people contradicted their reports. And these were married men, mm -hmm. but they were megalomaniacs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's the problem. The problem is, is, is men who are, who are asserting a kind of a sick sort of dominance over other people. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I don't want to say that what you're saying doesn't have merit because I do think that there, there is a problem with a kind of secrecy or a view of the priesthood as, as completely other that we have uh, at times in the Catholic Church, and that's, that's damaging. And celibacy can be a component of that. I don't think it needs to be. I think there's tons and tons of beautiful, healthy um, celibate folks uh, out there, of course. And I think it's a real call. I mean, it's a call in the gospel. Um, Jesus and, and Paul have, you know, very, um, I think, beautiful words about what it means to be celibate and, and serve the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the last Pope, uh, Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, he was worried about, he knew he could change it and he knew there are good arguments for doing so. But I think what he was worried about is this witness of celibate ministry disappearing and it being seen that there was a kind of pressure of sort of secular modernity to abandon this ancient Christian practice. I don't think that would happen because in the Orthodox Church, you have very strong Eastern Catholics and Eastern Orthodox. You have very strong cultures of married priesthood and of celibate priesthood. Regarding, Mary, uh, regarding women priests, I, the, again, I, so I converted to Catholicism in 2006. I was baptized because we were Reformed Baptists, so we didn't baptize babies. So I was baptized Catholic. So it was like a sacrament circus. So I was baptized, <laughs> confirmed, and um, First Communion all on the same night, Easter Vigil. I just had to die and get ordained and go to confession, and I would have all of them, but <laughs> boom, that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> or and get, get married, married, right? I was going to say <laughs> to get the seventh, right? Um, the seventh, the seventh seal. Um, there was a huge debate about women priests in the seventies and eighties, and John Paul II released an encyclical very, very strongly coming out against women being ordained. That debate, which of course many people just don't agree with. So in that sense, the debate has carried on. But at the ecclesial level, that debate has been sidelined or put on ice. And the current debate is women in the diaconate, which is very much a live debate. And Pope Francis has, has established a committee to examine that question, which is a very interesting historical question, because, of course, you have female deacons in the New Testament. So then the question becomes, what were these women actually doing? Is this the same as the, the male deacons that we see in Acts, uh, the seven first male deacons. There's the historical question mm -hmm. and there's also the theological question. So anyway, that's being examined. I'm open to whatever uh, these reports find. I'm open to examining these arguments. It certainly seems prima facie that there's a precedent for, uh, for women deacons of, of some kind. The real issue to me is women in genuine leadership, having genuine leadership opportunities in the church. We are seeing that. It's very slow. But we are seeing women who are on curial congregations. So these are kind of like the rope, like the cabinet, like the Pope's cabinet, I guess would be a good analogy. So we are seeing more female leadership in the church, which to me is ultimately the important question. And sorry, Kyle. It's all right. Just one more about that, because <laughs> here's the other hop button. Francis just said the other day that he thinks that Catholics should allow for civil unions between uh, gay and lesbian people, you have these three things that people have talked about for, you know, I would say for decades because I'm young, but probably for longer than that. Not the LGBTQ thing, but celibacy, women in leadership, and now honoring our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. If there's a Vatican III within the next hundred years, say, there probably will be, right? Would you say? Yeah, I just hope it's in my lifetime. Right. I'm worried I'm going to be recently dead. Yeah, just missed the, the I wanna, second one. I want to go to it. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you say would be, like, will any of those things be on the table at Vatican III? I think, I mean, it's so perilous to sort of like, you know, because I look at, let's say Vatican III is in 2070, you know, roughly 100 years after Vatican II. And then what I say now is the equivalent of what people would have thought in like, 1915 or 1920 
And I just can't see anybody getting that right. I mean, there were people who were saying like, hey, we need to look into dialogue with Protestants. And other people were saying, no, that's crazy. Why would, you know, so there, there were people raising the issues which are eventually on the table at Vatican II. So there's clearly precedent for that. But nobody, it would have been utterly impossible to predict kind of what is the confluence of theological thought and whatever's going on in the culture and whatever's going on pastorally that, that all sort of ferments and all comes together to make an ecumenical council what it is. Nevertheless, I would say that, um, I mean, married priest was on the agenda in a kind of indirect way very recently about can married men be ordained to serve these areas of the Amazon that have very limited access to priests because of geography and stuff like that. The majority of bishops there, I believe it was a two-thirds majority, I might be wrong about that, said, yes, we should do that. Francis ultimately said no, not because he thinks that he can't do it or that it would be heretical or something like that, but because he, he deemed it was not the right time or it was imprudent for some other reason. So a lot of this stuff is not issues of kind of black and white doctrine, but is issues of what is the church deciding to do right now and what is prudent to do, what is wise to do? Because the church could say, you know, tomorrow the Pope could say Latin Rite priests can get married. There's no doctrinal reason that they can't get married. They used to be married and our Eastern Catholic friends have married priests. He could do it, but he isn't doing it for prudential, practical reasons. Mm -hmm. Not that theology doesn't come into it. There is a theology behind it. Regarding this, the civil union stuff is, is really, really interesting. Francis is very clear that he doesn't think that men should be having sex with men and women should be having sex with women. Nevertheless, they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in light of that, mm -hmm. what do we do? Mm -hmm. And I think this is how Pope Francis approaches most problems. I mean, it's very pastoral and it's very practical. Mm -hmm. What do I do as a pastor when two 19-year-olds are sleeping together and they don't want to get married or they're in tons of debt and they can't get married or what have you, okay? So a lot of, a lot of Francis's pontificate is he has a kind of radical view. It's frankly, probably not that radical for a parish priest, but it is for a pope, the way that he speaks about this stuff. He has a radical view of how can I genuinely include everyone, given that the human family is super diverse and we all sin and there's tons of non-ideal things going on. So the, the reality, which a lot of Catholics don't like to talk about, is that the church condemns birth control, which means that the vast majority of married Catholics, straight married Catholics in the Northern Hemisphere, by the letter of the law, should not be receiving communion, technically. But there's been an enormous sort of accommodation to this reality, okay? Uh, most priests, if you push them, would never dream of cracking down on this and denying communion to everyone who doesn't make clear in the confessional that they're not using contraception or they've repented of past use of it or whatever it might be. And I know of examples of priests who have tried to do this and it hasn't gone down well with their parish or with their bishop. So there's been an accommodation on that. There's an accommodation on divorce and remarriage in many situations. And Francis, I think Francis is thinking of the issue of gay marriage, gay civil union, along the same lines that he thinks of divorce. Divorce is a civic reality, and it's culturally pervasive right now. And the church has responded to that. The church fought tooth and nail in the late 19th and early 20th century against the legalization of birth control and against the legalization of divorce. It lost those legal battles and it adjusted. And I think we're seeing the beginnings of a, what will no doubt be a traumatic and, and painful intra-Catholic discussion that's happening with the reality of gay families. And Francis, in my opinion, just says, look, it is what it is. I want these people coming to mass. I want these people included. I want these people thriving as much as I can mm -hmm. make that possible for them. That's how I read him on it. Can we just make Francis Pope indefinitely and prep him up like Weekend at Bernie's or something? I mean, like, man, oh, man. <laughs> what a guy. I mean, I don't know. I, I, get, I get the sentiment, but I feel like 
a lot of my LGBTQ friends would see it quite yeah, differently. Yeah, sure, right? uh, absolutely. Because inclusion up to a point is not inclusion. Mm-hmm. Um, accommodation is not inclusion. So, well, it depends on. I mean, you got again. You got to remember what what country are you talking about? I take this to be an a priori truth. I'm I'm not speaking contingently culturally. I'm saying, yeah, if, but he has to, right? Because he's the Pope of Africa, Philippines, Japan, the Netherlands, Alabama. Well, he has to in his role. So maybe this gets me to my next question, actually. So two two aspects of this question. I'll, I'll start with the one that's most relevant. And this will be maybe a nice segue into some of the papal infallibility stuff that I know that you work on. So thinking about authority structures, as we have been for a while now, why not say? Because, you know, admitting as you have that uh, the sex abuse scandal has a huge institutional component to it, that the core part of the problem, as you put it, is uh, a kind of love of institutional power over the the hurting person in front of you. So recognizing that that tendency of large institutions and systems to be breeding grounds for that kind of sin, that kind of love of power, why not say, as a lot of feminists have said, for example, that it is the institution itself that is the problem. So, so let me quote from one of my favorite historical feminists. All right, this is Mary Wollstonecraft, and I love this quote because of the way she puts it. She says, It is the pestiferous purple which renders the progress of civilization a curse and warps the understanding till men of sensibility doubt whether the expansion of intellect produces a greater portion of happiness or misery. I love that. Now, of course, she's referring to... She sounds like Jefferson or Voltaire. Uh, yeah, or I think they probably stole a lot from, from her <laughs> and uh, her, her predecessors. What year, did, what year did she die? Oh, my goodness. That, Do you have that? That was thing? late 18th century. I don't have it, though. I'd have to Google that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, but she's, of course, speaking about monarchy. But you, you've yeah, written yeah. recently about how the papacy is a de facto monarchy, more, more or less. Yeah, um, yeah, and so I think right. a lot of the same critiques would apply in this case. Why not just say that concentrating that much power in an individual or a small group of individuals is itself a sin? It is itself something that is intrinsically morally untenable, and that there are better ways to structure a body that that submits itself to the headship of Christ. Why not go that route? Well, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the famous quote from, uh, from Lord Acton, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that Lord Acton was a Catholic who was opposing papal infallibility. A lot of people don't, don't know the, the, the provenance of, the, of, of that quote. He was a, what, what you would call a liberal Catholic in the, in the 19th century sense, capital L, liberal Catholic, so liberal democracy, free speech press, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. The way that Catholics approach this issue is not to try to lessen the kind of prerogatives of the office of the, of the papacy, but rather to try to empower other facets of the church. And one big reason for that is the First Vatican Council. The First Vatican Council defines papal jurisdictional supremacy, which is actually the more important teaching and I'm sorry for the imp- impenetrability of some of my writing on <laughs> Vatican I, but it was, uh, uh, you know, the, the 150th anniversary, so I knew it was primarily aimed at, at Catholic theologians. Mm-hmm. So the, the idea of papal infallibility, of the Pope teaching infallibly, I think is a very thorny concept, not because I would deny the possibility of it, but because of how useful or not useful it's actually been in the history of the church. The reality is things stop being contested when they are universally received. Hmm. Sometimes that happens through a Pope. Sometimes that happens through um, just everyone prays the same liturgy. And, you know, so something like Jesus is Lord is just inherent in scripture, liturgy, prayer, whatever other kind of statements are considered sacrosanct because of a council the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Constantinople, and then there are other statements which, which come from the papacy, which, which were, are seen to be infallible papal declarations, but really were not contested. 
the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the Assumption of Mary. They weren't contested at the time they were declared. They were very much contested before that. So the issue to me is more the uh, kind of absolute power of the papacy. The issue to me is more the fact that the Pope has supreme jurisdiction over the church. That's the really thorny issue. And if you're, if there's ever to be a reunion with the Eastern Orthodox or there's ever to be a kind of Methodist right Catholicism or something like that of Protestants as a group becoming a kind of church within the umbrella of the Catholic church, which is how it would happen. It would never happen through individuals. It would have to be some sort of corporate unification. The issue of the Pope's jurisdiction is going to have to be tackled and I would think rethought in some fashion. But the idea that there's a, I I don't think that the corruption stems from that. I think the corruption, sometimes the papacy is on the right side, so to speak, of an issue or a problem, and sometimes they're on the wrong side. I think the 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 problem with this, you know, you're referencing, I presume, the sex abuse crisis primarily. Mm-hmm. The problem, unfortunately, is so multifaceted. It's not like there's a sort of corruption that originated in Rome and spread everywhere else, and we can't do anything about it because the Pope is a sort of absolute emperor over us. That's not the problem. The problem is local. It's in parishes, it's in diocesan offices, and, and it's and it's in Rome. So I, you know, is there a problem that needs to be tackled? Yes, but I don't know that the that the na- I, I view the nature of the problem more to do with ecumenism of relations with other bodies of Christians and less to do with intra-Catholic issues of corruption. If that makes sense. Yeah. I highlighted some stuff in your article uh, that I thought might be relevant. Oh, God, maybe I've contradicted <laughs> myself. I <don't... laughs> no, I don't think you did. But, I mean, on, on the topic of Pope as monarch or Pope as celebrity, because that's something you talk about a lot too, Pope as the focus of the church and also the world outside the yeah. church when they think of Catholics. So you say, now, much more so than in 1870, the Pope is the ordinary and immediate pastor of every Catholic. I, I like that. It kind of brought it home. Yeah. And you also said something in that article that struck me, because I, I didn't know this, that there have been discussions about the infallibility of the whole church. Right. What, what, how did that go, yeah. and where, where is that now? Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting thing. So th- this is along the lines of what I was just saying, which is that the, the way that you reform in the Catholic Church often is not to deny something previously taught, but to expand. Hmm. And the really interesting thing about what happened at the Second Vatican Council, which was 1962 to 1965, is that on one hand, they were they were progressing. They were they were, you know, incorporating new ideas. But on the other hand, most of these new ideas are things that they were reading in the Bible and the church fathers and the kind of practice of the early church. So the initial commitment that Christians had was that the church was infallible in the sense that the church could teach a truth about the gospel without error. So the idea of the Nicene Creed, there was a certainty that the Nicene Creed was a true interpretation of the gospel. That is primary, or is, 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 is before, it comes before any notion of bishops or popes being infallible, is that the believing community through the Holy Spirit, can know with certainty truths about the gospel. Not all truths, not every single detail, but that the church is not fundamentally mistaken that God is triune, that Jesus is true God of true God, took flesh from Mary, et cetera, et cetera. And that's because you would say, not you, but the Catholic Church would say, because of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, correct? Yes. So this is one of the one of the really important things about understanding papal infallibility in a way that doesn't make the Pope into a kind of oracle, Mm -hmm. which I think, sadly, this is not always understood by by Protestants looking in and by Catholics the way Catholics themselves understand it or express it. The the Pope is not infallible. No person is infallible. The belief of the church is that the Holy Spirit can preserve teachings from error. Now, this gets really thorny because one of those teachings 
traditionally, was that there is no salvation outside the church. Then Spanish Dominicans and Franciscans come to Mexico and they realize, well, the gospel has not been proclaimed to the entire world. So the idea here was Jews and Muslims are, are sort of culpably in error. They know that they, they've been presented with the gospel and they've chosen to reject it. That was the kind of medieval, late medieval understanding. They go to the new world and they realize there's millions and millions of people here who know nothing of the gospel. So they start thinking, okay, we have a commitment to an idea that outside the church there's no salvation. How do we rethink this? Because we believe that God is merciful. We believe that God communicates grace through nature, that he communicates to um, hearts that are repentant. So they start talking about baptism of desire. They start talking about all these ways that a an, an Aztec could have been a member of the body of Christ and not known it. Okay, So they'll never say there is salvation outside the church. What they'll say is, there are people who don't appear to be in the church that in fact are in the church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how reform and development works in Catholicism. Yeah. So the same, you see the same thing with, with infallible teaching and the kind of locus, the places that it can occur. So there was a real danger in the late 1800s for a variety of reasons, theological, political, cultural, of concentrating all authority in the Pope. The Second Vatican Council, to really oversimplify things, was trying to say, well, really... The Pope is the head of a college of bishops who are the successors of the apostles. So the gift of the Holy Spirit goes to the apostles. The bishops are the successors of those apostles, and the Pope is the head of the college. So there was a reorientation uh, of infallibility as the successors of the apostles and also as the entire believing community. So the entire believing community receives the Holy Spirit and when we are united in a belief, the, the Catholic understanding is that that, that, un, that belief is, is without error. This would be very basic things. Jesus is Lord. The, these sort of affirmations that the entire believing community affirms. As we talk, Sean, I'm, I'm thinking of the people, and there's probably several listeners who, who are listening to this right now and have been victims of abuse, not only sexual abuse, and not only by Catholic priests, but just victims of manipulation, of abuse, of all sorts of ugly things who feel just chewed up and spit out and rejected by the church. And then all of a sudden, we hear words like authority, and we hear, hear words mm. like infallibility. And that sounds potentially traumatizing to me. And not just on the Catholic side, it's easier on the Catholic side because of these words are so clear and heavy and, and weighty, but, you know, even someone in my position who's a person in authority, a pastor of a Protestant church who's kind of like the end-all be-all for, for, I wouldn't say for better or for worse, for worse, in my tradition. I'm sure sometimes for better. Let's, let's hope so, but I'm just listening and feeling like, man, this language has just got to be potentially so painful for people who have been manipulated by and abused by people in authority and power over them, particularly in the church, because we're talking about God now. And so I'm saying this as a pastor in one authority, you who have been abused, you who have been manipulated, you who have been rejected, you who have been marginalized by the church, we have to listen to you. Like that, there's, 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 you have a sacred story to tell that's more than just as important, more important than a lot of the stuff we're talking about, I just want to say. Um, and I'm sure, Sean, you seem like a very compassionate pastoral man. I'm sure you'd have, you feel that as well as we're talking. Certainly. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I mean, I, I we're having a certain genre of conversation when we start talking about papal mm -hmm. infallibility in Vatican I and Vatican II. And, and the reality is, the vast majority of Catholics in the pew, and this is even not even considering the the, uh, the the abuse crisis, but the vast majority of Catholics in the pew, this just isn't on their radar, right? I mean, they go to mass because they want to go, um, or their spouse wants them to go, or their community expects them to go, but they go, and they listen to the scripture, they hear songs being sung, hopefully they sing along, and they receive sacraments. Uh, and they pray a rosary, and they look at a painting, and they, I mean, so Catholicism for most people 
is not delving into the kinds of issues that, that we're discussing. Those issues filter down to them when bishops disagree or when, you know, a priest gives a particular homily at a particular time. But in general, I mean, take my wife's faith, for example. My wife is a very highly educated woman. She's a, a doctorate in English. Her Catholic faith is about waking up in the morning, making a pot of tea, looking at a picture of Jesus, which would have completely freaked me out as a 16-year-old <laughs> Calvinist. He kind of looks like Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan, but he's a very good-looking man. Uh, <laughs> looks at a picture of Jesus and meditates, prays her rosary or prays a decade of the rosary or something like that, mm. maybe reads a couple psalms, maybe reads a chapter from a gospel, does not do a study of the book of Numbers as I would have done as a kid. <laughs> um, you know, So a very different kind of piety and a very different understanding of the faith to, as an academic theologian, I have to kind of encounter and, and, and wrestle with these jurisdictional, technical language. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, what you're saying, I think, has real merit in that when the Catholic Church leads with, you know, we are the, you know, the, the infallible bul bulwark of truth, and sorry, we covered up 2,500 abusive priests in your diocese or, or whatever, you know, whatever the number is, that is a counter witness to the gospel. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. When I teach Intro to Theology, I am not talking about jurisdictional supremacy and infallibility and stuff <laughs> like that. I'm trying to say, okay, in, at my university, at, at my small university in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, most of my students are going into healthcare in some form. So I'm saying, okay, let's read the Gospel of Luke together. Let's talk about what are the kind of fundamental Christian commitments here. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus brings salvation. To encounter Jesus is to encounter God. Let's read these passages. Let's talk about them. So that's where I'm trying to meet the vast majority of people. Nevertheless, I'm a member of an institution with 1.2 billion people. We have to have these conversations. We have to deal with this doctrinal legacy, uh, for better or worse, hopefully for better. And hopefully these debates can, can trickle down, if you will, in a way that is affirming and healthy and life-giving rather than in a way that speaks to irreformability and, and static and um, where this kind of bulwark of authority. And the big problem to me, the biggest problem is if the infallibility of teaching religious truths is confused with an inability to sin. And that happens. The German word for infallible is uh, unfehlbarkeit, which means like uh, lacking nothing like uh, that's like one way to understand that word like that's a very bad uh, <laughs> you know uh, a very unfortunate word to have as meaning not no error in this statement about a theological truth that's a very different concept mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i very much sympathize with what you're saying and i'm not sure that i know exactly how to how to balance this yeah and i can say thanks be to god that people like you are the ones having this conversation and, and banging this out because uh, I trust you. And that's... Well, that's very kind of you to say. I don't know that I trust myself. <laughs> yeah. well, that's, that's the key to trustworthy people. They exactly. don't, they oh, okay. don't believe okay. that they are infallible. Yeah. Let me, let me ask the follow-up to the one that I asked earlier that I didn't actually get to since I said I had two at the time. I think I'm an epistemologist, so I, I think a lot about things like why don't people trust experts? That's something I've been thinking about a lot recently, actually. Right. And it seems to me that many, not being a historian, okay, so I defer to your expertise here, it seems to me that at many junctures in the history of the Catholic Church, a large part of the ways that it has gone wrong is its failure to trust expertise that didn't exist within the Church and that, mm. and that didn't rely on some kind of authority, whether papal authority or magisterial authority or, or whatever, the authority of the bishops or whatever. I don't know how that works. But, you know, there's the famous Galileo affair, and there have been many such mm -hmm. uh, things in the, in the history of the church. So at what point would you say does it become necessary for an institution as large as the Catholic Church to recognize a consensus of experts outside its borders? For example, the consensus mm -hmm. of experts about human sexuality. 
or mm. the consensus mm. of experts about some moral issues. There, there are actually some consensuses amongst non-Catholic ethicists about various moral issues that you will get a very, what seems like a very parochial view inside the mm -hmm. church when viewed from, from outside the church. So this, this is an issue that we've talked about in relation to evangelicalism. I freely admit evangelicals are much, much worse at this than Catholics mm -hmm. are. But there is still that strand of we possess the truth. And mm. that, you know, as Aquinas apparently thought, the truth is univocal, but coincidentally, all the arguments lead to my view. <laughs> um, so, you know, so when people outside the church, their arguments don't lead to that view or they're not convinced by your clever apologetic, well, they must be deceived somehow or in some way untrustworthy. They, we can't seemingly admit that the expertise sometimes lies outside our tradition altogether. Um, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you understand that as a, as a Catholic mm -hmm. theologian? But yeah, we, we have that issue for sure. The irony of what you're saying is I, just because of so many recent events, I thought, well, like the Catholic Church is totally on board with climate change science. You know, the Catholic Church is, 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 is I think, right about uh, the refugee crisis and all these other things that they're getting just hammered for in the United States in their own parishes, sometimes by their own priests and bishops, they're getting hammered for. So coming from evangelicalism, and no offense to my evangelical brothers and sisters, coming from evangelicalism, it is refreshing to hear Catholics say, well, we believe in systemic racism as a reality because everyone who studies it says it's real. Black people say they experience it. Um, people who study zoning laws and, and, and voting and housing and all this stuff say that this happens, so we accept it. So I think that the Catholic Church has, has is in, I mean, I don't know what issue, I mean, you, you mentioned issues about human sexuality. I mean, yeah, the interesting thing about it is there's a kind of descriptive reality mm -hmm. that I think the church, I mean, most Catholics accept there are people that are exclusively homosexual. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't say that's a myth. We can, we can fix them if they go to a accountability buddy camp <laughs> or whatever, you know, I don't know what these places are where they try to fix these, you know, yeah. fix people. That's not what the Catholic church does. Nevertheless, there's a, an adherence to a traditional doctrine about this is how sexual relationships are, sh should be conducted. But then there's also a kind of pastoral accommodation, which, as you said before, accommodation is not what a lot of people are looking for, mm -hmm. but an acceptance of, of a reality of the complexities of, of human sexuality. So in, depending on where you are, what community you're in, the Catholic Church could be a very welcoming place for someone who is gay or, or is trans or, or, or whatever, or, or it could sadly be a very uh, condemning and, and ostracizing place. And I think this gets to an, an important caveat of this entire discussion is I'm talking to you as an individual from kind of a podunk part of North Carolina that I love, but, you know, <laughs> A relatively backwater place, educated in specific contexts with a specific take, mm -hmm. and I'm speaking about a tradition that is on every continent and 1.2 billion people. Yeah. So I don't know. That's I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So you mentioned that you thought that was a fair critique. The other part of that question that I was reserving, so I'm glad you brought it up, is what do you think, maybe just name one, what do you think is maybe the most common or most important unfair critique leveled against Catholics that you encounter? I think today it's the idea that Catholicism is incapable of reform. Mm -hmm. That ultimately it says what it says, that's it, discussion over. Now, when you actually study Catholicism, that's actually not the case. It's it's very complicated. It doesn't mean that we don't have a prob that we don't have these systemic problems, which we've talked about many of them tonight. We do. But we do have a grammar. We have a way of making sense of change in a way that we believe, we hope, is true to the gospel, is true to our tradition, but is also capable of a kind of genuine reassessment in light of new information, as Kyle brought up, 
new circumstances. We see this clearly with something like the death penalty. Um, the church now says the death penalty is completely invalid in any circumstance. It used to say the death penalty is not only valid, but actually the appropriate response to certain circumstances. That's what the Catechism of Pius IV says from the 1560s. So we've seen a tremendous change. It's a genuine change. But is it true to the gospel? Is it true to our principles? I think it is. Some people think it isn't. They're really mad about it. I think it is. And I see this as healthy and as an example of the Holy Spirit guiding us rather than an example of us um, you know, tampering with, with revelation or, or something like that. There's way more we could go into there. Yeah, but we're going to have to call it at some point. This seems, this seems like as good a point as any. Yeah, and I've got, I've got a host of other questions, so it would be super fun, Sean, to have you on again. It would give me an excuse to drink bourbon on a Tuesday night. There you go. Yeah. So I would embrace it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so <laughs> before we do go, is there anything you want to plug for our listeners, anything you're working on now or have out that you would want to direct people to? Where can they find you online? And if you want to say that in your Woody Harrelson impersonation, that, that would be acceptable as well. <laughs> uh, well, the first thing I want to do is apologize if I've been too long-winded, because again, I've been teaching Zoom classes for you know the last no six worries. months, and it's great. And often, as Kyle knows, being long-winded is the only way to get through seventy-five minutes of Zoom. <laughs> um, now, what I'm working on, what I'm working on now that might have a little bit of wider appeal compared to some of the more kind of in-house stuff is I am writing a short book on Vatican II with um, an English theologian named Stephen Bullivant, who's a good friend of mine from from back in the day. You guys would love Stephen. I've seen his name, he, and I, a, I don't remember where. That's familiar. Yeah, he, do, he, he, he originally did systematic theology, but he started doing sociology of religion. Mm. So he does all kinds of uh, statistical, he does interviews and statistical research about uh, the nuns. Yeah. Meaning people who who are non practicing or no who tick no religion on the mm -hmm, census. Yeah. So he's a very interesting guy. But anyway, we're writing a short book together for Oxford University Press's very short introduction series. Mm -hmm. So it's about thirty five forty thousand words on Vatican II, and he's a great writer. So I'm I'm looking forward to nice. that. As far as Woody Harrelson goes, uh, <laughs> Kyle and I were were carpooling to German together. And you know, Kyle, these philosopher guys will go off on really weird shit. <laughs> and, and I, um, so I would pretend to be Woody, it would, you know, Woody Harrelson in the car with Matthew McConaughey. And Kyle is, I agree with y'all, he sounds Southern to my ears. Kentucky is the South to me. It's probably not to people in Baton Rouge. But he would just be going on about whatever open theism or whatever, you know. <laughs> and I would be like, <laughs> I actually enjoyed it, but I would pretend to be Woody Harrelson and I'd be like, why don't we make the car shut the f up time, Kyle? <laughs> you know, and then, of course, then he would sort of riff off that and be like, I don't know, man. I'm just thinking about, you know, nothingness or whatever shit he would say. And, and I would be like, people in this town don't think like that, Kyle. You got to you gotta cut that shit out if you come over for dinner, man. <laughs> So that's the Woody Harrelson. That's that's can, uh, yeah. It's not that good gotta, of Woody Harrelson. It's you just, gotta watch True Detective. True Detective. There it is. Kyle. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Sean, thanks for joining us. Thanks for spending time. And uh, really, really was a a pleasure. I think will be helpful for a lot of listeners to be able to understand Catholicism and uh, respect, hopefully, the way yeah the way Catholics go about their their spirituality theology. Um, is really fun. Good. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it, guys. I appreciate the, the challenging questions, and I also appreciate the, 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 the genuine warmth of it. Thanks for spending this time with us. We really hope that you're enjoying these conversations as much as we are. And if you are, help us get the word out. Before you close your podcast app, leave a rating or a review. If you'd like to share the episode you just heard with a friend or a family member, you can find those links on our social media pages. This has been A Pastor and a Philosopher Walk Into a Bar.